Hello. Hi there. My name is Jarvis. Uh, very happy to be here. I think you've been told to turn your phones off and all that business, haven't you? You won't want to have your phone on anyway, because something very exciting is going to happen. Um, I'm just going to do a, a short bit of, sh of full disclosure here. I, I probably am not going to be very professional as a questioner today, because um, I'm a massive fan of the person who I'm going to be speaking to. I was remembering on the way over here, uh, when I was supposed to be you know, at school and taking notice of things and stuff like that, sometimes I would be at home. I would, sometimes I would stay in the whole day listening to the radio next to my radio cassette player, hoping that they would play a Beatles song so I could record it. I shouldn't say that really, that's kind of illegal. <laughs> but, um, so my critical faculties are all out of the window, but I'm very excited as you might be able to tell. <laughs> and I'd like you to welcome to the stage none other than Sir Paul McCartney. Should I do it? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just here basking in your presence. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose if I just sit here basking, people yeah. might get bored after a bit. So I'll ask you some questions. Um, Go on. Then. It, it seems a, seems we're here in somewhere. This was your old school. I mean, yeah. you went to school here. Yeah. So that must be kind of a weird thing. Do, do you feel like somebody's going to come and tell you off in a minute? Like, <laughs> McCartney, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the boss now. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, it, it, um, yeah, no, it, it really does um, kind of freaks me out, but in a nice way, whenever I come back here. Um, my first time I ever came in here was when I was 11, and uh, you went to, if you were lucky, you went to the grammar school, and I went to this one. And we came in up there, because that was where the youngest kids were. So I remember kind of coming in, you know, sort of, wow, my God. It was like 1,000 boys. So, and I'd never been in a school that big or that posh, you know. And uh, so it was amazing for me just seeing this whole structured way of education that I'd not been used to at all. Um, and I was impressed. And of you course, know. now this is Lipper, this is a school for the performing arts. Yeah. I wonder what it was like at that time when you were here. Was like creativity encouraged in the, you know, in the school as it was then? Uh, not really, no. Um, in fact, the worst was music. Yeah. Uh, there was like no encouragement. Um, in fact, a typical music lesson would be there'd be about thirty boys in the class, and uh, the teacher would come in. We'd all be there ready for our music lesson. The teacher would come in and he'd, he'd have a little record player in the middle of the room and he'd put an LP on and he'd uh, just say, I want you to listen to this, boys, and let me know what you think of it. He'd put it on and he'd go out, <laughs> which was kind of fatal. You know, it was like, ha ha ha. So we would post one guy on the door as the lookout and then we'd get the ciggies and the cards and everything out. And, hey! and you know, let this record, we probably took the record off. Yeah. And, uh, and he'd come back and he'd look at it, he's coming! Come <laughs> get the smoke away and everything. And then we'd look, sit very studiously. I said, what did you think of it, boys? He said, it was really good, sir. <laughs> Fabulous, love that record. Sir. So when I was it, we and never got any more than that, never even a do 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 I'm sure none of that kind of behaviour goes on in this uh, school now. Oh no, of course not. 
now, you know, it was, it was exciting to say because having the whole range of ages from us little plebs, you know, up there to the swatty uh, prefects and head boys and teachers and the headmaster who was J.R. Edwards, who, he was known as the Baz. The so Baz. The Baz, B-A-Z. Oh, okay. Look out, it's the Baz. Oh. And he was the one who would cane you. Because we're talking old days here. Um, I mean, in fact, this is before I was here, but uh, Charles Dickens stood on this stage and lectured. No pressure. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not trying to put you off. <laughs> but um, so it was, it was like, you know, it was, it was kind of the dark ages, you know, but uh, it was. I was the, wondering about that, you know, uh, you're left handed. Did you get any stick for that, like at school? Because I, I remember mm. my mum telling me stories about they would say, "Oh, you can't walk right with your left hand," mm. and actually consciously trying to make Did you get forced to, to? Not me, but my mum got a lot of stick about it. Oh yeah. I don't know. If, did you get um, stuff like that? No, it wasn't too bad. But I do have a distant memory of sitting down to write with my left hand and writing my name backwards, writing P, but going that way instead of going that way. It's like mirror writing. <laughs> what does this say about him? So, uh, you know, so, but it, they never told me off I was allowed to write with my left hand. So you say you, you, you weren't really getting music education at school, so no. what do you consider the things that did teach you about music? Where did you get that info from? Uh, my dad was a, a good amateur pianist, and he was the guy at the family parties who would play the piano and uh, they'd roll the rugs back and all the ladies would sit around the room with little drinks. Because if you have little drinks, you don't get drunk. <laughs> Unless you have a lot of little drinks, which is what they did. And it never looked like they were getting drunk. But they would then sing all the, all the old songs um, of the time, of their time. So this all went in. You know, so I, I kind of still know those old songs and he would play the piano. And um, so I think all of that kind of ended up just, I sponged it in kind of thing. Mm. Um, but, uh, and when he, later he couldn't play the piano, he got arthritis. So I ended up as the guy who played all these old songs. When the red, red robin comes, pop, 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 pop. And, you know, well, I mean, that, I think that's one way I learned music. And then the other thing was that uh, he'd given me a trumpet for my birthday, and I kind of learned, because he used to be a trumpet player in his, in his little amateur band, um, and this was in the 20s when he was in the band, so it's all that body, oh, do touch, 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 stuff you see in the films, you know? Um, but uh, he didn't want to teach me. He thought I should learn properly, and so I tried a few times to learn properly, uh, but hated it. So when you say fun. properly, you talk about having to learn how to read music. And read stuff music like and scales. Do, 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 you know. We shouldn't be putting people off here, should we? Oh. Scales are really important. Yes. <laughs> this is what I mean to say to... Oh, <laughs> by the way, hello world, we're on Facebook. <laughs> hey! <laughs> it's a big hi from Liverpool to all you folks. Yeah, no, don't let us put you off. Learning music is a really great thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, but uh, the, the sort of guitar craze came along. It was at Skiffle, mm -hmm. like a folk thing. And uh, we all were very into it. So a lot of people got guitars. So I asked my dad if I could trade the trumpet in for a guitar, which having been a musician, he, he was fine with. So uh, then I had a guitar and uh, you, you met lots of friends who had guitars, so you would just talk. So it's where I met George, who went to this school, George Harrison. Mm. Um, I met him, he used to get on the bus, the stop after I did. It was about a half an hour ride into this school. Um, so if we ever sat next to each other, we would just develop our friendship and started talking about guitars. So then we learned chords off each other. And the great thing was, um, and then same happened with John, um, the great thing was that years later, if John and I were showing the guys a song, um, George automatically knew anything we knew. 
You know, it wasn't like we knew anything more. He knew mm. exactly. So we could just go jingle jingle, play it through, and he would know the song, you know. So, uh, but I think that's really where our music took off once we had um, this. And of course, it was a craze. Rock and roll mm. actually was coming in, you know, from Skiffle. And I remember actually being, uh, these used to be pews, not these nice, comfortable seats you're all sitting in. We had wooden benches, you know. And uh, I remember sitting back there with a copy of a music paper, the NME, and seeing a picture of Elvis Presley. And it was like, oh, wow, this is wow, you know. We were just enthralled with this guy. And then when we heard his records, that, that was it. So um, we wanted to do that. We wanted to be like that. That was how we wanted to live. That's interesting. So would, would you say that you saw Elvis before you heard him then? Mm. That's it's quite a, interesting. So did, that must have been kind of a bit mind-blowing to imagine what it might be like and then to actually mm. hear yeah. it. Yeah. It was an ad for Heartbreak Hotel, mm. one of his first records. And uh, yeah, we just, we just fell for the whole thing. You know, we just thought he was a great singer. He had a great sense of humour. He made great records and we just, we just, that was it then. So we, we got into a group. John was already in a group. Mm. So, but it was kind of, you know, um, you learned everything just um, by ear. And we never learned to write anything down. Well, this was something I wanted to ask you about, of, of how you remembered songs, because uh, if tape recorders were around, they must have been really bulky. Mm. It's not like today where if you kind of have an idea and you're out somewhere, you can like hum it into your phone or yeah. something like that. So how did you kind of remember? Well, I, I always think that was a great thing that we didn't have. We did, like you say, the big bulky one was called Grundig. Mm. They had a little blinking green eye in the front of it. Um, but we never had one. We knew a guy who did, so we borrowed it once. Mm. And we, well, I think we put a couple of little songs down on it. But we mainly used it for prank phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, explain. You're going to have to explain that. Okay, a little bit here's how it went. <laughs> Me and John, just in my house in Fawthorne Road, and uh, we've got this thing. So we, we suddenly go, you know what we should do? We should record a, a bit of dialogue and then leave a pause, and then say a little bit more, leaving pauses, and we'll ring up someone, and then we'll record the whole thing, you know. Um, so we ended up ringing his, one of his school teachers called Mr. Pobjoy. All right, good name. <laughs> so the dialogue went like this, you know, we put on voices, it was like, hello, is that Mr. Pobjoy? <laughs> Pobjoy here. We've, uh, I'm ringing about the bananas. <laughs> bananas? I don't know that. Yes, the bananas you ordered. Well, no, no, no. We were, going, <laughs> <laughs> we're loving it. I mean, that was mainly what we did. So we didn't, to answer your question, <laughs> we, we didn't really um, do much recording, you know. But the thing is, why I say it was a good thing was that we had to write songs you could remember. Mm. And I think that turned out to be a good thing. Um, so, you know, John and I would have a writing session and we'd write something, go away. It was normally in the afternoon, so then we'd go away and we'd have an evening out and stuff. And in the middle of the evening, you'd think, what was that thing we wrote? Oh my God, I've forgotten it. But it always came back in the morning. Mm. First thing in the morning, oh yeah, that was it. So you play it again and, and you just remembered it. And we, and we ended up saying, well, if we can't remember it, how do we expect other people to? Yeah. So I suppose you were writing stuff that was memorable. And I hate to say, we're still remembering it now. Yeah. You know, well, that's very true. All, the, all this time, man. Jesus. <laughs> um, I used to do a radio show, and one feature of that was a thing called On This Day. <laughs> so I had, Did you go like that? I had to do it in that voice, On This Day. day. Yeah. Nice. Um, I found out two things on this day from your life. The first one is the 25th of July 1963, you played the fourth of six nights at, Hammersmith, uh, at Western Supermare Odeon. I don't expect you to remember that, <laughs> but I just wonder, had you done something wrong to be sentenced to be playing Western <laughs> Supermare for <laughs> six nights in a row? I mean, it seems a lot of 
long time to be playing Western Superman. We could fill it, man. <laughs> no, I, mean, I think it was just because, you know, it, it, I don't know. We just, we did what the manager told us. Hmm. You're playing Western Superman. And of course, because it's a seaside place, we loved it. We went on the beach, got bronzies. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't so much the playing. That was just yeah, what we did in the evening. But uh, it was good fun. And there was another one, it's not quite the right date, but uh, in a couple of days, in 1968, you went into the studio and recorded Hey Jude, and the session went from 8.30pm till 4am. Did it? That's very nice. <laughs> the reason I mention that is just, as we're, as we're here, I, I, I wonder if that gives any insight into, you know, the recording process. How do you capture a song? You know, when do you decide... You've said this thing about, you know, you, you have a tune, if it sticks with you, then you know it's worth having. Mm. Then I, I guess the next decision is, when do you try and capture it, try and get it down on mm. tape? How, how do you make those decisions, you know? Well, I think when the, when the song's done, you, you, what happened with me with albums is I just write songs till I've got too many. And I think, well, I better record them mm. so I can write another bunch. Um, so yeah, you, you wait till you've got the song finished. And uh, I'd written Hey Jude. Um, I checked it out, played it to John, and uh, he liked it. There was one line in it that I thought I was going to change. I remember him, I'm up in my little music room up at the top of the house on this little um, kind of magic piano I had. Um, and I'm playing the song and I go, the movement you need is on your shoulder. And I turn around and say, I'll be changing that, don't worry. And he looks down and he says, you won't, you know. <laughs> it's the best line in it. So, you know, that, that was like, so um, he'd signed off on it. So we went into, um, Abbey Road wasn't available. Right. But, we, but we wanted to now that it was ready to record, we wanted to sort of get in somewhere. So we went to a place called Trident, which was in Soho. And... Um, the little studio we used to use. And uh, we just sort of went in, like, probably like you say, in the evening. Uh, we always used to work only at day, uh, during the day, because that was the way you were supposed to. But as we got more and more successful, and as time went on, we'd heard that people like Frank Sinatra worked through the night. So they said, we'll have some of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that became, became the sort of cool thing to do. So um, we came in and We'd kind of, you know, I'd, I'd play it through so everyone knew it. And um, you start recording it. And um, I think is, you know, with memories, particularly quite a long time, um, you get little stories that you tell. And, uh, and then I'm always back in my mind going, is this true? Mm. Is, you, is this, you're making this up? Um, but I remember, you know, I think... Um, sitting down and doing, hey, Jude, don't make it bad. And then just realising Ringo had gone to the toilet. <laughs> right, he's got his drunkard over there and he'd crept out, he'd gone to the... So I thought, hey, Jude. And luckily he didn't come in for a couple of verses. And then he's got to come in. I just see him at the corner of my eye. I'm thinking, this is quite a good take. I'm singing this well. I see him creeping in. Sits down on the drums. <laughs> hey, Jude. <laughs> hey. <laughs> well... I think we've just got to say that is true, because that's a fantastic story. I like it. Story. Yeah, I like I like that it. One. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to uh, ask some questions from pe people who have sent in questions. I know there's questions from uh, people who are here in the audience, uh, people who are studying here at Lippa. Also some questions that have come from Facebook. But could I start with one question, which kind of is almost related to that, which comes from my friend Richard Hawley, a musician from Sheffield. Never mind. Was that, was that a whistle? It was a Sheffield murmur. Scott Van, yeah. <laughs> and he was wondering, you as mentioned... you say in Liverpool, never mind, as long as you've got your health. <laughs> I think I've got that. Um, you mentioned Ringo then, and he wanted to know, because there was a craze around that time when you started of, of people having pseudonyms like Billy Fury and all stuff mm. like that, and mm. Ringo Starr, mm. did any of the rest of you think of having some kind of, like, superhero pseudonym. Um, yeah. yeah. Th this is what you thought you had to do. Yeah. Because, you know, Paul McCartney. It's like it's a it bit... It sounds good now. Sounds all right now. <laughs> yeah. I must say, I've, I've grown into it. 
um, put a lot of work into that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, we, we did think we had to be more glamorous. So uh, I was Paul Rameau. It's uh, a nice little sound, Paul Rameau. And we went on a little tour with a guy called Johnny Gentle. Because yeah, this is the thing, all the other people were like Billy Fury, Danny Tempest, Marty Wilde, and we got landed with Johnny Gentle. <laughs> all right, you know, so we're, we're playing and we're backing him up and there. And, uh, and you'd, get, you'd go up there and there'd be all the little, it was in Scotland, there'd be little Scottish fans. Oh, what's your name? Paul Ramon. <laughs> they go to George. What's your name? Carl Harrison. <laughs> and John, it was Long John Silver. <laughs> and that was it. And, but Ringo came with the name and everything. You know why? Because he was, we always kind of, he was the oldest in the group, but he was also to us like the professional. Because we were kind of amateurs, we were, we were sort of students. I, was, I think one of the nice things about the Beatles we weren't really serious about showbiz. Mm. We just sort of dragged into it. You had to be in it to play. Um, but uh, Ringo had his group. He was in Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, and um, another another pseudonym. Powerful name. Another pseudonym. Another name. Powerful name. Yeah. Another pseudonym. Um, he was actually Rory Rory Caldwell. Um, anyway, so he he was in that band, and they were like we thought they were like really pros because they had a season at Butlins. <laughs> which is a holiday camp for any of you global <laughs> listeners um, and that was a great gig you got to go there you got to sort of settle in you got your rooms you got the girls mm. and you were the big rock stars you know so Ringo became Ringo Starr with lots of rings for that you know but uh, he was the only one but yeah we, we changed you know Paul Ramon it's good mm, it's still, um, I might go back to it <laughs> Um, let's have a look. Well, here we are. Maybe this is slightly uh, related. This is uh, someone who should be in the audience. Stephen Geisler. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Stephen Geisler or Geisler. Are you here? You can just say present, sir. <laughs> uh, Stephen's question is, if music hadn't worked out, what other career could you have seen yourself doing? Well, you know, at that time in this school, um, you would go to the careers master. I don't know if it still happens. But, you know, as you're leaving, you, you sort of uh, school to go out into the big world. And I went in, this guy, and he's talking to me, what do you like, da, 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 da. And it turned out I only had enough qualifications to be a teacher. Oh. Which I thought was kind of well, weird. You, you know, it's like, you're no good, well, you can be a teacher. <laughs> go and teach other people not to be good. <laughs> You've got a knack. <laughs> So that was what I was well, I th due to go and be. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're breaking that kind of thing within this academy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We don't do that anymore. No. We're much groovier now. <laughs> Here's one. Uh, is there a Brian Campbell in the audience? Hello, Brian. Uh, Brian's question is, is there a song you are jealous of and wish that you had written? And if so, why? Or what is it? Uh, yeah, there's always a couple that I hear, you know, that I think are nice and I would like to. Um, I liked Sting's Field of Gold. Mm. And I thought, you know what, I, I should have written that. <laughs> How dare he? Did you, did you let him know that? Yeah. Yeah. I told him, you stole my song. <laughs> and I thought that was a nice one, you know. Um, let's have another one here. Some of these are very long. I'm afraid we won't get a chance to go through all of them. Um, You're whipping through them there. I've got them here, but he's gone, gone out of order, so I'm totally... I'm on Georgia Wren. I don't know who you are. I'm on number 10, Thomas Whittaker. You've really belted down. Sorry. Right? <laughs> Gosh. Thomas, Go on, Thomas would like to know, what was the last piece of music or album you listened to that you found quite impressive or has stuck with you? Um, I think uh, probably Kendrick Lamar. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I liked, and so I, I mean, you know, talking about modern stuff, so the last piece of music must, must mm. be modern. Um, and 
not so modern. I liked Kanye's um, dark, twisted fantasy. So I like that's why I ended up working with him because yeah. I like that. Um, other pieces, I don't know. There's, there's one out at the moment that I think is very catchy, which is uh, Christine and the Queen's mm. record. I like that. It is like totally Michael Jackson ripoff, <laughs> but we don't mind. <laughs> And how do you hear music now? Because there's so many different with, ways. With, with these. I know with that. <laughs> Good answer. I've got two. But I'm talking about what, because there are so many, I suppose industry speak would be delivery platforms or Ooh. whatever, but there's so many ways you can. I love it when you talk dirty. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, really. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, because, you know, as I, as I, I don't know if you could hear uh, before you took the stage, I was saying I used to stay at home, just listen to the radio, hoping a Beatles song would come on and record it if, if it did. Mm. I'm sorry about the not okay. the royalty, We're so you. <laughs> But you know, now there are many other yeah. ways for kids or anybody, you know, to, to hear music. So yeah. how do you? Um, me, it's mainly radio, probably in the car. Yeah. So, you know, in any journey, I'll just sort of listen and see what I can hear. Um, I still have CDs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Come on. Um, and I listen to them, buy them and listen to them. And then I uh, Spotify mm. on my phone. Um, so, I, you know, quite a few ways. I uh, still play vinyl. Yeah, well, that, it leads me on to something I wanted to talk to you about, actually, because I, I was reading stuff you were saying about your new record, Egypt Station. Mm. And one of the things you, you said about it was that you wanted, you wanted to make an album that was like an album, how mm. you remember albums are. Mm. Which, for me, when I think of that, I think of a vinyl album, I think mm. that that's, in a way, recorded music found its ideal home there. You know, mm. the length of, a, mm. of an album, the fact it's got yeah. two sides and stuff. But I don't know, was that what you meant by that? Yeah. Um I mean, what I thought was, these days you've got, you know, the big stars like Beyonce, Taylor Swift and Kendrick and those people. Um, you know, more particularly the, the first two. Um, th their songs are, in a way, a collection of singles. You know, they're all great commercial tracks, but it doesn't kind of roll through like a Pink Floyd album used to, or a Beatle album. Mm. Um, and I, so I thought, well, I can't compete with that kind of... Taylor Swift thing, she's got better legs than me. Uh, Marginally. You're hiding yours, I know. Your I know. So we don't know. You should see these. Um, but uh, so, you know, I thought, well, maybe what I can do is just do a sort of what used to be called a concept album. So it's, it is a, it's an album that, if you want to, you can sort of listen all the way and it, it should roll through and take you somewhere. Mm. So that's what I've done with this new one. Um, so the cover is part of the... the yeah, because is that... I was going to ask you about the title of the album, but I believe that's the, the name of the painting that's on the, on the cover. Is yeah, right? yeah. Um, I did a painting and, uh, and uh, it had Egyptian iconography in it, because I, I like that kind of thing, so I put some of these images in the painting and mixed it up a bit. Um, and just to remember it, I called it Egypt Station because it had sort of Egyptian things. And I never thought any more of it, but people quite liked it. So I liked that one, you know. And I was looking at it one day and I thought, it's quite a nice title, that Egypt Station. So I thought, well, that could be the new album's title. And then I thought, you know what, the painting could be the cover. Mm. So uh, we started, that's where it started. And then we got some really good art directors who took it somewhere. But um, yeah, that's why it's called that. And so, you know, we start off like with a station noise. So you're sort of in a station. And then a choir swells out of that. So it's like heavenly station now. You're tripping, dude. <laughs> and then it goes into the first song, you know, and then it carries on. Yeah, and then and I shouldn't, well, am I allowed to? I'm not going to yeah. spoil it, but then You're at the end we, we end up in this, we go to the station again, don't we? With the we go to the station again. Yeah. yeah, we do. So you know that that's that was the idea was to do something like like that for uh, 
people who like that kind of album that goes right through rather than just because the thing is of course people are just only going to choose the single that they like they're only going to choose that track and that track but there will be those amongst us who will listen all the way through yeah and I think like, as we were saying about I think an album is, is, is the format for that I mean mm. I, I do that I don't know whether I'm representative of any demographic or even human being but uh, <laughs> But I, I enjoy that as a thing to do, to sit on the settee, put a, a side of an album on and just... It's a nice amount of time, 20, 25 yeah. minutes, and you go into that world for a mm. bit mm. and then you kind of resurface, make yourself a cup of tea, put the other side on if you want, or, or whatever. It's a, it's yeah, a, no, it's know, it's a really it. pleasant way to absorb some music, I think. Yeah. Well, so that's the idea with the new album, yeah. yeah. That's good. Now... Um, Here's another one. This is kind of, well, this, maybe this is slightly related. Number 11. <laughs> Carter Fleming, are you, are you present? Hello, Carter. Carter would like to know, have the developments in technology for recording and composing music affected your writing process in any way? Kind of ties into what we were talking yeah, about. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it has, actually, and I think it's maybe affected it adversely because you can record anything anytime just reach your phone bang you got it so i find myself with like thousands of sketches da, 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 that'll do yeah it's like i'll finish that one day so i've got thousands of things to finish mm -hmm. um and i don't think that's a great thing when you didn't have that you tended to have to finish it so uh, and the, the process that John and I used um, is kind of still how I use, it's still the one I use. And it was just basically to sit down, come up with a bit of an idea of a song and f finish it. Just keep doing it, keep doing it keep, until you got to the end mm. and then you'd written the song. Um, which I think was probably good rather than having a, a little fragment, a little sketch that maybe months later, you'll return to, and you'll be trying to recapture the vibe mm. that you, you did listening to it. And um, so I don't think it's as good a system. And that, that I, would th I would complain about that, mm. just because it's too easy to put ideas down and, and then just not bother. And does that also go through to the studio as well? Because obviously now you can like, record everything and then you can, if, if a bit goes wrong, you can edit that bit out and mm. let's combine take one with yeah. 6,000 and, and then auto-tune it so it's all the same key. <laughs> oh, you've seen me record? No, I know what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I wonder, no, it's true, I, no, that's I, what you can do. No, but I wonder with this record, it doesn't sound like it was done that way. So I, I wonder whether, yeah. you know, what, what was your method when you... No, it, it, I think it is a really good, strong thing if you can get... Um, the original performance with your band or what, however, down all in one. So you've got the kind of spirit of it. And uh, so quite a few tracks on the album we just did with the band. You know, we, we learned them and did them like old school. And then we maybe overdubbed and maybe did this and that, you know. Um, but there is something that comes through. Mm. It's the spontaneity. And why I remembered that I must do that was listening to old Beatle records. Yeah. And you hear them, they're so kind of fresh. They're right in your face, you know, particularly the real early ones. And you think, wow, you know, how does it still sound so clear? And I think it was just, it's the spirit got onto the record, you know. Because we didn't mess around. I mean, we're talking before about, you know, how we recorded. Um, we first came down from Liverpool, got our first recording contract with Sir George Martin blessing um, and we were told what they wanted us to do because they were grown ups and we were 20 something uh, and we didn't know had no idea what you did in the recording studio so they just said show up at 10 o'clock and between 10 and 10 30 get ready you know tune up and have a ciggy cup of tea whatever you want to do and then at 10 30 the producer will come in and you'll start the session. Then from there you had one and a half hours to finish that song mm. completely. Which 
we never thought it was a pressure because we didn't know anything else. And they just sort of said, you know, George just... So George Martin had come down, and me and John, often it was, unless it was George's song, but it was often me and John would have written the song the week before, and because uh, our manager would ring us up and say, you've got a week off. We'd go, wow, great. He said, to write the next album. <laughs> and we'd go, great, great. I mean, it seemed like um, enough time, you know. So we did it, and we'd bring it in on the Monday morning. And it was only me and John knew it. Um, so we had a couple of acoustic guitars. So we'd just sing it, you know, do, 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 whatever. George and Ringo would, would watch it, and George would clock the chords, Ringo would sort of yeah, to clock the beat. And then we'd just separate, I'd go on bass, John and George would go on guitar, and Ringo would go on drums. And we would just start um, recording it. So that it gave us about, we probably had about an hour and ten left to do this record. Mm. And that, because that was the only time you had, you did it. And then you had to do another song um, uh, in the morning. And then you had an hour off, so it was like 10.30 to can't do the maths. 10.30 plus one and a half you hours, 11.30, 12. You obviously were in this school. <laughs> I must say, that was one subject I wasn't good at. Um, yeah. Amongst the many. Anyway, then you'd have from then one, you'd have, from 12, you'd have to 1.30. Then you had a break of an hour, you came back and you did it all again. Two more songs. And so you were knocked off by five-ish. And you'd put four songs in the can. Which you know by today's standards is like silly, but the it's thing is, unheard of. It's unheard of now. I mean, yeah. that, that usually, somebody will have got the snare sound by then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just about switch the computer on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's true. Yeah. So it was. It was a great system, and uh, that most of all the early Beatles records were done like that. And uh, what I liked about it was, that after you'd finished, you'd put in this hard day. Um, you had four songs, so you were kind of proud of yourself. Then you could go out in the evening. Hmm. You'd have something to eat, or maybe go to a play or something. And I think that informed the next day. Yeah. You know, because we were down in London, so I might go to like the National Theatre and see uh, a play. I was going out with an actress at the time, so we'd go out and see uh, Juno and the Peacock, and uh, got Colin Blakely in it. And it was so good, you know, National Theatre. Wow. And you'd come back and go, yeah. And I don't know, it somehow informed what you did the next day. It raised the bar a little bit. Mm. So I was always glad that we had those hard working days, but the evenings off. Yeah. The way you speak, you speak about it, I wonder, do you ever come here and like, have you ever taken a class here or anything like that? You know, yeah. as, as you're saying about the thing of people getting something down quick. Um, yeah, I haven't done sort of a recording thing. Mm. I, I do the songwriters, so I come up here and uh, I basically listen to uh, a bunch of songwriting students who are kind of my students, you know. Mm. And um, I always say to them, "Okay, look, you know, I don't know how to do this." Uh, you know, which is going to get a bit a of a sort of strange, strange look. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, great <laughs> teacher. See. Yeah. It was always destined. But I, what I mean is, um, I actually don't know how to do it, and I don't want to know how to do it. And I sit down to write a song, I hope it's something I don't know how to do, and I hope it's new, and you know, I don't want to think, oh, it's got to do that, it's got to do this. And if I find myself getting predictable, I'll try and break the thing. So I say that to them. And, um, and then after the shock's gone off their faces, um, they will then play me a song, they play me their work. And I'll just kind of critique it, I'll say, I'm just imagine we're writing together, and what I would do would be this. And by the way, you don't have to accept it because it's your song, it's not mine. Um, but generally, you know, they accept it. <laughs> <laughs> are hard. No, you know, I mean, hopefully I make good suggestions. No, that, I mean, I think that's really interesting because, as you say, uh, this is a, a, an academy, and it, it, it's, it's to some extent a formal education, and that's not something that you had in your in mm. your music education. Mm. And, and I, I, it's interesting to hear that you, you know, communicate that because I, I agree with you. I think music 
is a very kind of slippery beast, isn't it? To how you tell whether something's good or not is really like one. I, I don't know whether you get this thing, but like one day you can write a song and think, yes, Grammys, come on. <laughs> and then you listen to it the next day and go, oh my God, <laughs> it's crap. Yeah, and, 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 another, and, and it can work the other way. Like you write something you think, it's oh, that's rubbish. And then, mm. and then listen to it the next day and you, and you realize it's good. So that kind of thing where you can never pin it down. Mm. In some ways, is frustrating, but also is what's exciting about it because yeah. you never tame it in a way. Well, that's what I mean. You know, that's why I don't really want to tame it or know how it goes. You know, and the thing is, um, we learn it, by doing it the way we happen to do it or happen to, to have done it. I mean, I'm saying the Beatles, all the Liverpool groups, all the British groups, the British Invasion for America. I don't know any of them really knew how to write or read music. We, we sort of didn't need to. I remember talking to Jeff Lynne about it. He said, well, we just made it up, didn't we? <laughs> you know, and he's right. That's what we do. We just sort of made it up, you know. But I, I will work with um, people who do know how to do it. For instance, something's got to be orchestrated. I will bring in someone who actually knows what to tell the orchestra, you know, and how to write it out. Um, but often they will say to me, oh, wow. I've always wanted to ask, that song, was that three, four, two, four, one of those bars? I go, I don't know. Because <laughs> we, you know, cause we made it up, so we just go, it goes, dun, you know, good day, sunshine, ba 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 da good. And there's somewhere in there, there's a two, four bar or something, you know. Mm. But we just went, oh, it went like that. Yeah, <laughs> changes there, yeah. And uh, I, guess, I think it was more exciting. Yeah. The minute it's, it's written, for me, not for, of course, you, all you kids around the world studying music. And your parents spend, spending all that money. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, I, it is also great to go the other route. It's just not the route I went. Yeah, well, it's funny, it reminded me of something now, because one of the most frustrating things of my adolescence was buying the Beatles songbook, because I was such a fan, you know, and, and sitting down and then suddenly having this terrible, crushing realisation that I couldn't play any of the songs, because they had all these kind of chords that were like all over here like that. And I wondered about that, whether... You, I bet they didn't consult you about those songbooks, or, or did they? Did no. they come and say, well, how do you play this song? No. No, I mean, the chord symbols was all we could ever read on, on sheet music and the yeah. words. Um, so that's what we used. We would just look up the chord symbol and we knew a lot of the chords, you know, as we... Because the thing about the Beatles, we started here in Liverpool and played little clubs. Then we went to Hamburg. And going to Hamburg was like a big experience, not just for young kids let off the leash mm. in the strip district. Um, of course. And that was also <laughs> revealing. Um, but just that we played so long, we played like sometimes eight hours straight through kind of thing, you know, we'd have an hour on, an hour off, an hour. Um, but because we played so much, um, you learned lots of stuff. We learned lots of songs. We didn't want to get bored. And you know, at that age, the worst thing is, oh God, we're doing these same 10 songs again. So we had millions of songs and millions of chords. Um, so that's what happened. We, did, we sort of developed just along the way by learning chords. I mean, there, there used to be a shop where we got our guitars here called Hesse's. Um, it was owned by a guy called Frank Hesse. And in there, there was like the guy who could play the guitar, yeah. you know, in, in the music shop. And he was our big hero, Jim Gretty. And he would, uh, he would play, he was a jazzer. So he would sometimes play these amazing chords, you know. I remember me and George just studying it and going, what is that, what is it? Oh yeah, which is like an F chord, but he'd got these funny little things going here. Oh yeah, okay. And we learned it. I mean, I still don't know what it was called. It's an F demented or something. <laughs> <laughs> but we learned it so that it suddenly, around about that period, you hear it on quite a few of our songs. It's in Michelle. Do, 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 do. That's it the F comes. demented. Though. There it is. <laughs> yeah. And in uh, Till There Was You. Yeah, we just used them. But, but that was the thing, you know. And, and it, is, it is funny because um, I remember 
you know, talking with loads of groups and the kind of people we'd hang out with when you're doing shows and things or TV shows. And uh, I remember sitting around with Travis and the guys from Travis and we were just chatting and he, they were playing me one of their songs and it sort of was in A and then it went to F sharp minor. So I go, and, 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 oh, I said, I like that, F sharp minor. And he says, oh, is that what it's called? He says, we call it one up from F. <laughs> I'll do. It is, sort of. Well, that's it. As long as everybody in, everybody. in the band calls it that, then you're all right. Exactly. Aren't you? That's all you need. So I have another question here. Uh, this is number 12. John <laughs> Reynolds. Yo. <laughs> what, John? John Reynolds would like to know, out of all the musicians you've worked with, who do you admire the most and why? Oh. Out of all the ones I've worked with, uh, it would be uh, fellow Beatles. It would be John, who was pretty cool, and George and Ringo. Um, you know, having worked with John um, so one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, I, I could see his, I got to see his brilliance before the world did. So, you know, I would get to hear across the universe and Julia, and some of these songs, you know. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, and when we would work together uh, on something like Day in the Life, um, he, often what would happen is whoever was going to be the sort of creator of this song would bring in the first verse. So you sort of, you knew what it was going to I read the news today, oh boy, yeah. okay. And then we'd sit down and we'd take it from there and we'd sort of write it all down and develop it and do the thing. So, um, yeah, so I've seen John at work, you know, so, uh, obviously. And um, it, little things he did were, I thought, brilliant. You know, I, I started a song, it's getting better all the time, and he went, it couldn't get much worse. <laughs> I go, get that down. So, you know, just those little things where you'd, so I think, I think, um, and then I think Stevie Wonder, <clears throat> you've got to go to Stevie, who was just a musical monster, you know. He's, he's fantastic. But, uh, well, he's got everything on him because he's got, somebody was going on about Stevie Wonder to me the other day, like, you know, he's got his, he's even got two voices. He's got like the high Stevie and then he's got the angry Stevie, like, rah, 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 that kind of, kind of. And then, then he can play the harmonica. And then somebody showed me this uh, clip the other day where he just plays the drums amazingly as well. It's just he's like, a great drummer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah no, he is, and, and the, the little guitar thing he's got now, and he did keyboard, obviously. But, um, yeah, no, I worked with him. We did the record Ebony and Ivory, mm. um, which some people thought was a bit glib. You know, but to me, I thought it was kind of a cool thing, you know, the, the black and white living together in harmony. What's wrong with that? Um, but it was, it was great fun working with Stevie on that. Um, he, he, we came out to Montserrat, which was George Martin's studio in the Caribbean, and uh, so we, we were working there. And um, Linda, my, my first wife Linda, said, well, invite Stevie over, I'll cook, I'll cook lunch. It was a Sunday when we were taking the day off. So I said, great. And I said, hey, Steve, I'll bring him up. Steve, um, do you fancy coming to lunch? Oh, yeah, yeah, man. yeah, sure, sure. So uh, I said, great. I think about two o'clock, will that do? Great. So I told him, two o'clock. She said, okay, so she starts cooking with two o'clock in mind. So three o'clock comes, and I go, I better ring him. Hey, Steve, how you doing, man? What's going on? You know, he's like, oh, hey, Paul, oh, yeah. I said, you, you coming over? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just heading out the door. Yeah, I'll be there in two seconds. Well, 10 o'clock that night, <laughs> I'm serious, 10 o'clock that night, felt like going behind him. <laughs> oh, who did that? But <laughs> 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 <Right. laughs> right, uh, he, he just, he showed up rather late and it was okay. Cause did he have a good excuse or just? No. <laughs> he, you know what, you didn't need one. That's the thing about Steve, you just, you just got to go with it. He's just so good, and you can't say, well, what kind of time is this? You know, but um, yeah, so we had a great dinner. It was somewhat burned. <laughs> hmm. 
Um, I've got one here, uh, number 13, David Harrison. This question, actually, this is also uh, my mum asked this question as well. Mm. So it must be brilliant. It must be a good question. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favourite cover version of a Beatles song? Because I think, I think the Beatles do hold the record for the most covered band ever. So there's a lot of cover versions yeah. out there, aren't there? So yeah. Has there any caught your ear? Uh, yeah. Um, the one, the earliest one that really caught my ear was by Esther Phillips. It's a kind of R&B singer, and she did a female version of "And I Love Her" mm. called "And I Love Him." which is really great. I love it. And then later, uh, Ray Charles did Eleanor, Eleanor Rigby, which was, I loved. Mm. Um, and you're saying, you know, yeah, our stuff's been covered. Um, I was lucky when I come up with this song yesterday, because that got covered like about 3,000 times. I think 3,000 people, maybe over there, had recorded that. And I was always amazed, 3,000, wow, you know, that's so great. But I thought, who are these people? You know, so I said to one of our guys, I said, Do you want, can you get me like the top 10? Just get me the sort of top 10 best ones. And just so I was, and I listened to them all. And, well, they were great. It was like uh, Frank Sinatra, hmm. Elvis, um, Marvin Gaye, very cool, um, Ray Charles. And you know, the list went on. And it was just amazing people, amazing versions. The funny thing was, though, when I listened through them, um, it was Frank, Elvis, and I think Marvin, who changed the lyrics a little bit. In the middle, I go, why she had to go, I don't know, she wouldn't say. But they changed it, why she had to go, I don't know, she wouldn't say, no, sorry, why she had to go, I don't know, she wouldn't say, I did something wrong, is what I think. And they go, I must have done something wrong. <laughs> Like, you know, disclaimer. <laughs> I don't think I did. <laughs> Maybe they say I did. I don't think I did. I'm Frank Sinatra. Yeah. I'm nervous. You know, I must have done something wrong. Oh, come on, guys. Although I can't think for the life of me what it was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They say. Um, well, this is one, Phil Christopher. Um, Maybe we've covered this a little bit, but uh, how would you teach an aspiring songwriter to write a successful song? Well, I suppose, first of all, I mean, how write a song. I don't know whether it's um, successful. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I don't know, really. I don't know. Like I say, you know, I actually don't know how to do it. But what I would do, if I was now going to write, try and write a song, I would, first of all, go somewhere very quiet like a faraway cupboard or toilet because <laughs> it's embarrassing writing songs. You know, you don't want to do it in public because you want to you make your mistakes in private. So yeah, I, would, I would get somewhere very quiet and, it, you know, probably take a guitar and then just start noodling around on whatever chord you fancy that day, whatever. So I'm just coming in my mind, it would be A to the one up from F. Um, <laughs> So I'd be, you know, I would start with that and start just sort of noodling with it. And just dun, 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 dun. And just kind of select a, a rhythm or a tempo that feels okay in the mood I'm in. And then I'd just start sort of singing over it and just see what comes out. And sometimes something crazy comes out. And, but I would kind of go with it and just try and follow the trail. And um, I think the main thing is to stick with it and not just go, oh, this is terrible. Because often the second verse or the chorus can get great and then you can sort of go back and fix the beginning of it, you know. So um, that's what I do. And uh, I just keep going and then I just write the words down as I go. And sometimes the second verse is better. So I switch that to the first verse. And... Um, just keep going till I feel like I'm... And then you, if you're lucky, you get in a kind of pocket where you think, oh, I'm actually enjoying this. I did it recently, uh, even though I've finished the album and I'm trying not to write songs. Um, I was going to the gym and it was closed. So I come out, oh no. And what am I going to do now? 
<laughs> I've got an hour to kill. And uh, so I, I picked up my guitar and just went ding, 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 and thought, oh, that's okay. I'll put that down on my phone. I thought, no. The voice came, no, don't do that, Paul. Finish it. Went, the other voice, no, don't finish it. You were going to be in the gym. Forget it. Anyway, this one won't finish it. So I sat down and started with this little thing. And instead of putting it down to the phone, I just pursued it and kept going on it. And it, it turned out OK. It turned out as a song. It's interesting you say that thing about having to find somewhere where you're not going to be overheard. Yeah. And that must have been difficult. I, I watched, uh, I guess a lot of people in the audience have seen your appearance on the carpool karaoke thing recently. Mm. Have you seen that? If you haven't, have a watch of it. As part of that, you go back to your old childhood home. Yeah. And finding a place, you know, private to kind of write songs when you're living in a house of that size yeah. must have been pretty difficult. Yeah, well, it was the toilet. Yeah. Plus the acoustic. But that can, that can cause problems of its own as well, <laughs> if you monopolize in the <laughs> toilet. True. Paul, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it did occasionally, and then I would have to stop, let someone go, and then go back in. <laughs> Holding my nose. <laughs> but another uh, thing that I found interesting that you said whilst you were there was, was this thing of uh, feeling the distance that you'd travelled from that place. Yeah. But also how formative it was, how clear it was in your mind as well. Mm. So if I understand correctly, that was the first time you'd been back there since you lived there. Yeah, it was, you know, I'd, I'd been outside, because, you know, I'd come up to Liverpool quite a lot with Lippa, and let's hear it for Lippa. <laughs> so, you know, I'd come, I'd come up here, and so I'd uh, often fly up, and then I'll get a, a car self-drive from the airport, and I'll drive whoever's with me um, around, and, we, you know, just take the, all the routes, and... Uh, so we go through, like, you know, speak, where I used to live, and I'll sort of say, oh, you know, I used to live down there. And, 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 and oh, I once drew that church over there for an art competition, which I actually won, I hear, I won it. There was only two people in the competition. <laughs> and he'd won the year before. I think they let me have it. But anyway, you know, so I'm going around and telling all these stories. And when I get to Fourthland Road, which was my old house, um, which is now a National Trust thing, um, I, I would never go in. I, I would just pull up there and I'd sort of say, oh, that's my room there, that little one over the door. And that's my parents' bedroom. And that was the living room. And, you know, tell them all the stories about it. I never, never really want to go in. I think in, it might be a bit spooky. Mm. It might be a bit sort of strange going back to your, your old place, you know. So I'm doing this one time. I'm sitting in the car. I'm showing this friend. And this old Liverpool guy walks past and he doesn't he goes, yeah, he did live there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, with, with, with James, um, it was like he said, no, we should go in, you know. And I said, oh, OK, OK, we go. And I loved it. It was great. Um, and it wasn't spooky. And it was just, it's like this place, you know, it's just full of memories. Just everywhere I look around, you know, I'm playing, playing shove apnea on those benches at the back there with George and, uh, you know, coming, coming here for seeing the headmaster and all the teachers walk in with their gowns on. I've never seen people in gowns, yeah. you know, my little primary school never had any of that. So, you know, just, there's just so many memories. Getting the cane, for instance, <laughs> which was a, a nice wonderful one. memory. I'm now heavily into S&M. <laughs> I blame them. Well, I was going to get on to that later, but as soon as you brought it up. <laughs> I grew to like it. No. <laughs> Not true. Now, but you used to get the cane, you know, and I keep the kids these days. You can't really imagine what that must have been like, but it was, that was what happened, you know, if you were cheeky, and we were, mm. you know, we were always just, you know, Liverpool guys anyway. You've got a problem. Young Liverpool guys and, you know, the, the, the kind of like me and George and those guys, there was always... So we're always getting in trouble. And you would get the cane and you would have to hold your hand out. You go to this little office down there, it was the, the Baz's office, Ted Master, and you would... That was the worst if you were called to his. And you would have to hold your hand out 
and he would give you what they called six of the best. Mm. And he would just take this bloody great thing out, a long rod, and he would just whack, and whack you. And you know, you, you put, it, put it back up, and whack, you just have to, you know, hence my love of s and But um, <laughs> um, one time, the story goes, George was getting this. We, we got it quite often, I'm afraid to say. But um, George got it once, and the, uh, the teacher doing it this time missed and got him there on the artery. Now, that's dangerous, because you know you, you've got arteries that can open them. That's like these days, you, you, you just, the, they, the teacher would be expelled, yeah, anything like that. Um, but those days, it, it didn't matter. Uh, anyway, so George has got this big wheel on his wrist here. He goes home and he's having tea with the, with the family. And his dad suddenly notices, he says, what's that on your wrist? He said, oh, I got cane today, you know, I have to admit it. Dad got bloody hair over the cheek of it. Well, the next day in school, over there I think it was, um, <clears throat> George is in class and a little knock comes on the door. And it's another teacher. And he says to the teacher who cane George, can we see it for a moment, sir? So, yeah. so he goes outside and there's the teacher who came George and the teacher who's showing George's dad in. So George's dad in there, he says, did you cane my son yesterday? He goes, yes, I'm afraid, poof. <laughs> oh yeah, sweet justice. Laid him out. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it, it is a barbaric practice, isn't it? I mean, it's mm. kind of crazy that it did exist. I, I received, somebody just waved at me and I don't think they were being friendly. I think they were telling me that we've got five minutes left. So oh, really? oh. I've been remiss. I have, haven't asked you any of these Facebook questions. Well, so let's I, do a few. Yeah, let's do a couple of those. We can go a bit longer. Yeah, you think? <laughs> Would you like it to go on a bit longer? <laughs> yeah. It'll go on forever, if, as far as I'm night. concerned. All yeah. Night. Okay, so we've got uh, Ina or Enna Okada from Facebook in Japan. Hello, Paul. I just can't wait to listen to the new album in September. Which songs would you think that John would say, oh, that's a good one, from Egypt Station? And which ones would your wife, Nancy, like most? Uh, lots of love from Ina. OK. Um, I think John would like a song called I Don't Know. Hmm. I think he'd like that. Um, and uh, I, I know that Nancy likes a song called Confidant. Hmm which I, uh, I wrote to my guitar. It sounds strange, but it's, it's a long story. It's another of my perversions. I write to guitars. Well, that's interesting because I, I, was looking at, I, was, I was lucky enough to uh, see you sound checking and, and you were playing that song and I was thinking, mm. who's that song to? Yeah. I didn't realise it was to an inanimate object. <laughs> <laughs> and people are not, unless I explain the story, people are not going to, because it, it does sound like it's sort of a breakup song it's to someone I don't like, mm. um, but it isn't. It's, it's, it's a long story, but, uh, so, but Nancy likes that one. Yeah. Um, Danny Costello from Facebook in Buxton, UK. I know Buxton well. You probably do. Lovely water. Sheffield. Lovely water. Is it? Yeah. They bottle it. They do, yeah. <laughs> it's because it's so lovely. <laughs> Oh, right, yeah, well, this is again about Egypt Station. I, I've heard that you have a painting called Egypt Station. Can you tell us a bit more about it and why you chose it for the title? I mean, we, we have kind of covered it a little We've bit. We've sort of done that. Yeah. Um, well, the, the thing was, I like kind of looking at um, reference books, his history books, for um, uh, often for like old symbols. So uh, on the cover of uh, Egypt Station, there's an onyx. And so I like that image. And I'll often see um, statues or Aztec or you know, that kind of civilization. And what I think is amazing is some of them look very modern, mm. but they're, they're from you know, a long time ago. So I like those. And if I like the image, I'll put it in the painting and just put other things in it. There's a kind of sort of guy in there who's definitely not Egyptian. And I'll just mess it up so it, it kind of becomes kind of like a little surrealist composition. And um, so that was that, I made that painting and I, I called it Egypt Station. Mm. 
Mm. And it's like you were saying, that it seems to be something that's fed into your music a lot. You were saying about the thing about the Beatles sessions ending and then you could go out and go to the theatre mm. or whatever. But, you know, uh, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong here, I believe that the, the apple on the Apple label comes from a, a Magritte painting that mm. you, you own. Yeah, right? I, yeah, um, yeah I, I developed a love for art. I'll tell you really when it started. I, I liked it anyway as a kid growing up. But um, in 1953, do you believe, um, when I was 11, coming to this school, um, the Queen was crowned. It was the coronation year. And um, so they had a competition, which was um, an essay competition. And you had to write about the monarchy. So, so I, I did, you know, I wrote it all neatly and everything. And I happened to win one of the categories. So um, where am I leading with this story? We're talking about your love of art. Love of art, thank you. I was off on one then. <laughs> no. no. So, um, so you got a prize for winning this competition. And you got, one of the things you got um, was a book on the monarchy. It was a great PR exercise for, for the monarchy. And the other thing you were allowed to choose, and so I choose, chose a modern art book. Um, mm. And so that, I used to just look at that all the time. So by the time I got some money with the Beatles in the early days, I liked to sort of look at art and stuff. And I had this really great mate who was a, a owner, a owner of a gallery called Robert Fraser. And um, he really knew his art, you know, so I could kind of get advice from him. And uh, I I'd, I'd enjoyed looking at this René Magritte, a Belgian, Belgian painter. And um, he, he knew his dealer. Right. So Robert said to me, do you want to come to Paris and we'll have dinner with the dealer? He's, he's, he's invited us. I said, yeah, great. And it was funny because Robert was gay. And I had told some of my friends, you know, I was going to Paris with Robert. And they go, are you sure? <laughs> I said, I'm quite secure about my sexuality. Yeah, don't know about that. <laughs> well, that with the S and M, I mean, just <laughs> we're getting there, aren't we? Now, um, anyway, we go over, we go over, um, and uh, the guy's name was Alexander Iolas, and he was his dealer. And so we have dinner and everything. Then he, it was above the gallery, so you go downstairs and these little stairs, and there's all these Magritte paintings, right. oils and stuff. So it was like, you know, for someone who loves his work, and. Uh, I could, I could now afford to buy a couple. Now I couldn't. Mm. I mean, you know, they are like, phew, but they were like 3,000 pounds. And now they're worth a bit more. But um, yeah, so, so that kind of started in the love of art. And in, in all of that, I saw this apple. And what happened one day, Robert knowing I loved this, I was out in my back garden in London doing a little uh, music video with Mary Hopkin, actually. Right. Um, and I, so I was busy, and Robert knew I was busy. So I came back in from the garden, and he'd left this little painting, little oil by Magritte, propped up on the thing, and he'd split, he'd just gone. So, and, the, and what the painting was a green apple, and written across it in, in Magritte's writing was au revoir. So I thought, that is the coolest, most conceptual thing anyone's ever done. Just leave a Magritte there with au revoir. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I, that, that's where it came from. So, and what, people say, why was it apple? Because, you know, there was an apple before apple. You know, because people think we mean an apple. Um, but we mean apple. <laughs> so, uh, and why we did it? People say, why did you choose that name? It was A is for apple. Yeah. We just liked that it was near the beginning of the uh, alphabet. Um, so Apple, would, would, it was like on any list, it would come early. So we kind of liked that, we liked the idea. And then ABBA went and beat us by being a, a B. <laughs> so they came before us on the list. I'll never forgive them. <laughs> well, that's, well that, that's what it was. I'm it? not going to get forgiven if I don't wind it. I would love to talk to you for the... Maybe until the end of time, but uh, <laughs> I know that we have to stop. Um, thanks ever so much for submitting to my uh, questioning. Um, it's good fun.
I have to say to, ev to everyone, hang, hang around as well, because I, I, I believe something exciting is going to happen behind that curtain quite soon. I hope so. I also know that you're going to come and play in Liverpool in December, is that right? Yeah. So everybody right. should prepare themselves for that. Yeah, we are playing um, at the Echo Arena in, in December. But the thing is, we also have, tomorrow, we have a little secret gig somewhere in Liverpool. You're kidding me. I'm not kidding you, Jarvis. Would I lie to All right. you? Well, on that cliffhanger, ladies and gentlemen, please, support the cops. Jarvis, thank you.